This podcast and video is proudly brought to you by Yoplay. Taste the brighter side of life. Avian Garrahi, you are extremely welcome to the laughs of your life. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so this is absolutely a first and I hope to God we haven't bitten off more than we can chew. Um, but we'll give it a bash and what's the worst that can happen? The babies wake up next door. What? <laughs> the babies wake up next door. <laughs> All right, okay. I'm praying, Hopefully that doesn't happen. I'm praying they stay asleep. Please, God. Um, well, the good thing is your family. You are my big sister. And so if it does all go tits up, uh, <laughs> we're in it together. So we might as well start at the beginning. Avin, your first memory of laughter. My first memory of laughter is a very difficult question because, uh, as you know, Darren, and it was probably one of the reasons I had reservations about agreeing to this. Uh, I have a very bad memory. I don't know why. <laughs> I uh, Maybe I get it from my Auntie Anne. We've had discussions about this in the past that, uh, that she's very bad. Mom is brilliant at remembering stories. She's not so good and I'm very bad. And I think Alva and yourself are, 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 are much better at me. But uh, I do have some memories of Doolin. And of course, you know, there in Doolin is where we spent all our youth. Uh, any chance we got, it was always the first port of call. And uh, I have a lot of memories in the cottage in Doolin with Nana and Grandad and, uh, and just great times. But the earliest, I think, and the Mrs. Bouquet and mom would probably not appreciate me telling this story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have memories of hopping up in hysterics on the couch the chairs in complete terror and fright as dad chased a mouse around the sitting room with a brush and uh and I also remember being completely hyper then after it uh with all the adrenaline and the suspense and the intensity of mom setting a mouse trap behind the cooker <laughs> and it sounds awful but I was absolutely wired to the moon at the thought of the mouse being caught and I started to march around the kitchen with the sweeping brush again, just chanting up your by you, up your by you. <laughs> in, my, <laughs> in my best Claire accent, because I hadn't gone to school at that point. So um, I, mom and dad, uh, obviously they came, they were both from Claire. They had a Claire accent. So I had a, a Claire accent uh, until I, probably four or five, until I went to school. But um, yeah, I have memories of that and the excitement of it, catching the mouse and doodling. I remember seeing a home video of this. So you were marching around. The, I think you were in a nappy and uh, and dad was, was setting the trap. But in the same batch. So obviously Alvin, and I don't remember that. We were way smaller than you and you were only a smaller yourself. Yeah. But in the same in the same batch of home videos, I remember there was a, a, a little a, a moment of about maybe 20 or 30 seconds <laughs> where you were looking at the camera singing. Do you remember what the song was? Okay, Sarah, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. You were looking straight down the lens, being like, Okay, Sarah, Sarah. And I had a list. I had a list. <laughs> and I was kind of a little bit cross-eyed, and I still kind of think I am a little bit cross-eyed at times. But uh, I had a, a little turn in my eye. It was the funniest thing. Um, but Honora now has that same lisp. I was <laughs> yeah, yeah. Her yesterday, she was saying nice, and she said nice. <laughs> And the tongue nice. comes out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, great times in Doolin. The best times. Like, the best memories. Um, I also remember our... about you you being, and maybe Alva as well, uh, being washed in the sink in the kitchen. Do you remember <laughs> that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that everything, was, uh... everything on show, everything on display, like, and people coming and going. And it, it was always an open house, like, and there was always someone calling um, with lobsters or, I don't um, Potato cakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or soda bread. bread. Yeah, soda bread. And, and, uh, and everything happened in the kitchen. Like, it was just, it was a hive of activity. Uh, okay, Avin, the first time you felt laughed at. And I, I'm oh, sorry, I'm going to jump in here. Mm -hmm. I don't think you were laughed at a whole lot growing up. I think as the eldest child, you 
um, skip past a lot of being laughed at definitely by siblings because by nature as the eldest you're just kind of the coolest so you set the bar for what's cool and what isn't so I don't think you were laughed at too much at home were you not at home well I was I was I was bullied it has transpired that I was bullied by what (laughs) (laughs) no you no, I wasn't bullied, but like I, I was easygoing, I think. I think I was probably the most laid back of all three of us. And so like I just kind of was happy to move aside and let you two just be complete hooligans. And you were like, and you in particular w- wanted always to steal the limelight. <laughs> and I think I was oh. quite easygoing about that. And we've seen videos like and, and you've shared videos of of like me literally just being shoved aside by or, or belted like. <laughs> <laughs> but no I mean in in school um like I, I was totally not cool but I thought I was cool like it was it wasn't a cool bone in my body but I thought I was cool why do you say that well I'll tell you now why and we're about to talk about you know when I did eventually feel kind of laughed at and I suppose I was a very late bloomer in the sense that I was very good I was a very good girl um for the most part, like I, I didn't drink until my leaving cert was finished and I was a late bloomer when it came to to boys. And uh, we, we like grown up, we, we spent, as I said, our summers in the West and uh, in a year was where we used to go every summer um, for two weeks. Mom would bring us out to the Iron Islands and dad would come and go uh, when he could. And we would pack everything but the kitchen sink, like Grandad Jack in his highest van would pack it up to the brim of everything we brought from Dublin, the bikes, the cooler boxes full of food for two weeks, because obviously, you know, there weren't many shops out in this year. Um, Like the the surfboards or boogie boards or wetsuits, you name it, we had it with us. Picnic baskets, blankets, and the world and his mother would see us coming like, the granddad used to <laughs> fill up the van, drive, reverse it down the pier in Doolin. We would load the the ferry boats full of our stuff. And then when we arrived on the island, they would see us coming a mile off. And we probably had a reputation uh, and and we didn't realise it for a long. Well, I didn't anyway. I, like we were in our element and mom used to like bring us on such excursions and they were amazing. Looking back, it was like an amazing childhood and and great memories the adventures on the island like the picnics and the crack and uh you know the trips on the bikes and everything but I suppose as I got older and as I became a teenager uh, and started to fancy the local lads and you know there were a few that I fancied and uh we just we were always together as a family and they would see us coming. I remember once coming over the brow of the hill. We were on our way down to Cayley, or I was at least. I was old enough to go to the Cayley. Uh, we weren't in the cloche. That we weren't there on Irish College or anything, but we used to stand at the back of the hall and watch all the the um, students at the Cayley. And the locals used to do the same. And when I started to, to fancy a few of the lads, I used to do that every evening where I'd just be a total awkward teenage creep. <laughs> A total creep, like at the back of the room, just staring. <laughs> and I was a frigid, as they call it. And uh, and I had, you know, I'd never kissed anyone. And uh, yeah. I used to just kind of try and be cool and try and my- make eye contact or try and get them to notice me. And I remember coming over the hill with uh, the full entourage of you, Bob, Dad. I think maybe you were all going for food or something in one of the pubs and I was going to the, the Cayley. And I heard them say, like the the locals and maybe like some of the cooler girls that used to go there at summer, like in the summer as well, and used to hang around with the locals. And uh, they shouted up the like up the road to us, "Oh, here comes the family!" And it suddenly dawned on me that like <laughs> we weren't cool; we were like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> You, you would have been you would have been around 13 or so at that time yeah and so yeah. and uh, and I was like eight so that's yeah. like I think w- when you think about it in like in in difference of stages of life like I was so much a kid you were so much the awkward stage Alva was kind of yeah. in the middle but you and Alva were chums so you didn't mind Alva but you were definitely absolutely mortified Mort- of me mortified yeah more and I just wanted the ground to swallow me up like and whatever like 
whatever level of cool I thought I was I just that was it was just crushing and after that then it, you know Inchia was kind of tainted for me after that because I then knew you know what they kind of it was very difficult then to shake that off you know and yeah. uh, and after that then it, it lost its its uh, sparkle for me like yeah it definitely did which is so sad but yeah we kind of I suppose stopped going well it was I suppose we were growing up like you were finished school maybe I was you it know, wasn't everyone whatever, that whatever. late. No, it wasn't that late. We 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 stopped going um, when I suppose there was like there was tennis and stuff like that during the summer. We couldn't miss that or like the competitions or something. I don't know what the reason for not going was, but it was earlier than me finishing school. Definitely, it was like it, I I never went in a sheer having kissed someone. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking because we used to we used to as you were saying there we used to land on the pier with all the the, the cooler boxes and like yeah. like as in full on like remember there used to be like four bottles of Robinson's orange like <laughs> as in it, it wouldn't be just one just in case like we'd have a full on it was as if we were going into lockdown oh totally yeah island life and like oh god and everything was a trek like we had a, a house that we rented over the other side of the island there was one shop and if do you remember like if we did anything if like if we pissed mom off if we cursed or something we were sent to go and get the milk and that was like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the trek ever you'd be like no because we were in the priest's house which was like the the other side of the island but when i i actually think i mean do you remember do you remember i one summer in particular we rented i don't know if it was the priest's house or if it was another one but we were it, we had a kitchen that looked literally directly onto the Atlantic Ocean and we yeah. had a we had a breakfast bar type thing that was like high stools and I remember every single morning without fail we'd cut we'd walk into the kitchen and there'd be toasted McCambridge's brown bread butter and rashers yeah and like when I think of that now like that is we just Have... took it as given like mom just did that for us and we didn't even think oh my god no one else in my class gets to experience this like we we just took it as given I know, I know. And just on that, on the, the whole late bloomer and, you know, late to, to get the shift, like I was a bit of a princess about it. Like I wanted it to literally be Prince Charming. <laughs> <laughs> and I think eventually mom felt very sorry for me and uh, and she fully kitted me out for baby Wes, which was like, it was, it was like. Actually, I was, it, it was iconic. <laughs> Uh, for for those who don't know, Baby Wes, it was like just all of Dublin, really, like in their what maybe 13, 14, early teens anyway, uh, would would rock up to Wes and uh, the queues, like the queues used to go all the way back into Donnybrook. But anyway, I was going to be, I was eventually allowed to go to Baby Wes, and Mom fully kitted me out in a belly top, full on belly top. But no, in fairness, she didn't do you an injustice because like you had the, like you had a four pack when you were like 12. Yeah, if only it stayed. So you life. looked good. So it was fine. But you, by God, did you get the shift that night? <laughs> but the fact that mom had something to do with it, it's just mad. Like, so funny. It's kind of weird. She did you a favor in a way, I suppose. Um. Anyway, yeah, they're lovely. They're lovely memories of childhood. I hadn't really thought of in a while. So thank you. That was so special. Um. <laughs> We'll move along. So, Avian, the moment if you didn't laugh, you'd cry. So I don't know whether this was mom and dad laughing, not crying or or me laughing, not crying. I suppose like our house, as you know, was uh, it was like a house of constant make believe. We would reenact scenes from Disney movies. We would uh, reenact scenes from school. We would make shows and plays and movies and like it all went down. And I suppose it was to kind of keep us off the road, keep us off the green, as mom used to call it, the Valley of Strollers. And uh, <laughs> and we would, everything would happen in the house. And I don't know whether it was mom and dad's wedding anniversary or it was Valentine's Day or um, what the occasion was, but I decided anyway that we needed to to like create a home restaurant and treat them uh, to a meal. But I can't cook, never could, never will be able to cook. It's not for want of trying. This story will prove that. Uh, 
you know, I, I have always attempted to 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 create something special in the kitchen, but it's just never worked out. <laughs> and I'm the type of person that just dives into things. I've always been that way and, and clearly never uh, do any research um, because this time in particular turned out to be a complete disaster, purely because I didn't put any homework in. I didn't do any research. I was the cook anyway in the kitchen and you were, I think you were the waitress. And I... <laughs> And Alva has spoken in the past about her obsession with cash, cash registers. She was the host. She was Alva taking... Alva was on the till, yeah. was on the till. And uh, they, like mom and dad, le- like gave us the reins. They left the kitchen completely to us. And I think uh, um, it was like the Uncle Ben's rice and sauce and chicken. What could go wrong? And I wasn't young. Like I was probably 14, 15. <laughs> But I didn't read the back and I just lobbed the rice into the, the Le Cruzo pot, if you don't mind. Oh, They're not God. deep. And uh, the rice was left on too long. It got burnt and it started to smoke or whatever it does <laughs> or stick. And uh, I noticed that it was burning and it was sticking to the bottom of the pot. So I took the pot, the Le Cruzo pot, over to the draining board, like in the plastic draining boards. Yeah. And the heat of the pot stuck to the draining board and melted the plastic draining. I don't know if it's plastic, whatever the material, but it was like plastic. Uh, like yeah. it wasn't a metal draining board, it was plasticky type one. And the yeah. plastic melted and stuck to the bottom of the Le Cruzo pot. And I was absolutely stressed out of my brains so I I lifted it again for I didn't know where to put it then I didn't want to ruin the counter I didn't want to ruin the sink so I put it back onto the cooker the electric cooker hob thing and the plastic stuck to the glass of the hob (laughs) and and then then when we went to lift the bloody pot off the (laughs) hob the hob smashed the glass smashed (laughs) So I ended up costing mom and dad thousands and thousands and thousands of euro. Uh, they had to get a whole new kitchen, new sink. And they got no dinner out of it. <laughs> so like, in fairness, I don't remember being absolutely crucified for that. Like, I think, I think they just laughed for a fin- yeah. because it was just so um, catastrophic. <laughs> That like I think the only thing they could do, and the only thing we could all do for a finish was just laugh, but uh, it was a disaster, a complete disaster. But I don't, I don't remember being like hounded for it. And then the most recent time I remember uh, just having to laugh because if I didn't, I would just, I don't know what I'd do. Was uh, on my second child, Levon, only recently, last November, in labour. The baby was coming and uh, I was there, like I was in the, the late stages of labour and um, John was with me and I had a really bad pain in my back for a finish and uh, I was sitting on the edge of the bed and uh, I just wanted him to kind of create resistance. I was closing my eyes and I was working on my breathing and uh, in agony, obviously. And uh, I said, can you, John, can you just pull my arms out I was like on the edge of the bed and I wanted him to pull my leg or my arms out like stretched so that he was creating resistance and I could kind of stretch my back a little bit just to try and relieve some of the pain. And uh, I had my eyes closed and I had just asked him to do that. And next thing I just felt a thump on my lap (laughs) and and I opened my eyes and he had fainted. (laughs) And I'm going there for a split second because the the nurses in fair the midwives in fairness to them just grabbed him and swept him away like because they knew it would be like, really really bad for me. Uh, to see, so so he was gone then and like I just I, I turned one midwife stayed with me and she's like you're okay Vin I'm here and in fairness to her she took my arm and I just said he is never I said to her he's never <laughs> ever going to live this down. And I'm going to tell everyone I meet because like men are just made of different stuff. Like, And he was oh back then. We had, had to put him into bed, give him like a, a, like a sugary tea. He was back in time for Leopold's appearance. A sugary but... tea. <laughs> I just love, I just love that you didn't, you barely even noticed. And the nurses were like, Jesus Christ, get him out. Just get him out. Just get him out. 
<laughs> well, they said like it happens all the time. They're probably used to it. But like, what a disaster. Like, oh, just at the moment, I really needed him, you know, because he had been kind of redundant up to that point. He was just like sitting there saying, yeah. you know, you're, you're doing great and, and taking pictures and just annoying me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're like, I have literally never been so bloated in my life and I'm sweating profusely. Get the camera out of my face. <laughs> but he was so, there. Yeah. He was there for the real deal. So that's the main thing. He was there, yeah, when, when she arrived, yeah. But thanks to the nurses, they, they gave him what he needed and, and uh, you know, slapped him around the place a bit and then in he came again and he was like, all's fine, nothing to see here. And I was like, you're just, you're never, ever going to live it down. So that was that, yes. Okay, Avian, tell me, your no laughing matter moment in life. I think... Um, because this podcast is going out in the middle of a pandemic, it would be strange not to mention it because I think, you know, we're going to look back on this time. It's just a really surreal time. And I think we're going to look back on it. Um, and I, I'm sad to say, but I think we're going to be quite bruised for a long time. Um, and so I, I just wanted to kind of to mention it because regardless of your situation, regardless of you know, whether your your business is really struggling or, you know, you're um, you're on the front line or you've lost a loved one or um, you're really missing your family or you're cocooning or um, or you're trying to, to juggle from home, whatever your situation is, I think it's affecting everybody. And uh, and it's difficult, like really difficult. And we're doing a great job as a nation, but um I think, you know, even now when I look at movies and, you know, we're watching more TV now and we have more time to do things and I'm looking at movies like, you know, really famous movies and scenes with like people in the movie where they're together or like there's groups of people together. And I can't help but think, look, oh, geez, they're very close. I know. And it's like it's, know. it's like it's almost affected our whole psyche, like where will we ever be the same again? Will we ever have that sense of connection again to one another? I just don't know. It's so weird, but I can't help but look at stuff now and and that was, you know, happened in the past, but I'm like, God, they're very close to each other, which is just awful. I know it's just been embedded. And and like, I haven't been, I haven't wanted to be in a nightclub. And so maybe, maybe two or three years, like I haven't wanted to go to a buzzing nightclub where everyone's rammed on the dance floor. And now I'm like, I would give anything to be in a sweaty dance dance floor with Dua Lipa playing, like, you yeah, know, and is it ever going to happen again? Yeah. Really weird. It's just a really weird time, but I do think it's, it's going to affect us in a weird way. Um, yeah. So it's it, that, that part of it is, is a no laughing matter situation, but, um, in my past, uh, and to and to find one that hasn't been mentioned by other family members, I suppose uh, the night I said goodbye to John at Everest Base Camp is like a moment in time that I will just never, ever forget. And like John's not a crier at all. He doesn't really he doesn't cry. He doesn't like I've I've known him now over 10 years and I've seen him cry a couple of times. Um, but that night, like we like he was due to to obviously start the expedition. The next day, I made the choice to trek in as far as base camp because I wanted to feel part of the expedition. I wanted to be able to come home and relay information and feel like I was kind of um, I was well informed when it came to, you know, the, 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 the team he was with, the setup there. I wanted to kind of look the Sherpas in the eye and say, you know, mind him. Mm. Uh, of course, I can't because you can only control what you can control. And there's so many uncontrollables. And I suppose that was what. Uh, what frightened me for a finish like I knew he had done everything he could I knew the setup was right I knew the team were amazing uh, I know I knew he was with the best company and things were looking good and and you know I knew that all of those boxes were ticked but at the same time on Everest and it, it's such a hostile place a hostile environment that like there are so many things that you just can't control and yeah. so that night in my mind uh, at that particular time uh, was potentially the last time I was ever going to see him potentially um a 50 50 chance you know and and so that was just it was so difficult and I had to then trek out on my own 
well I was I was with other people but like without him uh and so to turn to turn around to say goodbye that was just like I remember that night we just we were in the same we had our sleeping bags we opened up both sleeping bags we just like uh spooned each other all night long and just sobbed like sobbed we didn't get a wink of sleep but we just sobbed and so Avine to anyone who might be listening to this and thinking okay cool so why did you let him go what would you say look I suppose you just can't hold out the tide uh it's as simple as that I think if you know uh it's something it was a long time coming. It was like 10 years in the making. I met John and at first date was postponed because he was, he was going off climbing. Like it, it's always uh, the John that I know, it's always been a part of him. And, uh, and now looking back, like had I stopped him, I would have resented myself for that, mm. let alone you know him resenting me. Uh, that's his, that's his thing. That's his self care. He, he, he works in, a very intense environment, uh, a very comfortable environment in the hotel where there's lovely food and there's the comforts of the hotel and uh, you're meeting people every day and it's it's full on. Um, so to get out in the hills and to get out in the fresh air and to have the rain pelt against your face and to eat a soggy sandwich on the on the side of the of the mountain is is like that's his thing. That's just what he what he loves. And so uh, he needed a, he needed a, you know a goal and why not make it Everest I suppose uh because you know he needed something to keep going back to and to keep motivating him to to uh you know to stay fit and he lost his dad young so he wanted to make sure that he was minding himself and and that the same wouldn't happen to him and and if I prevented that like how could you live with yourself um it's different now we have kids like I'm never going to stop John from doing what he loves but I think you know you have new responsibilities when when kids are involved and all of that, I don't know if he would do it now, to be honest. Um, there will be other challenges and other adventures, but at that time, the timing was right. And, you know, I really invested in it. And like, as I said, I went as, as far as base camp and, and loved it and and do love the Himalayas and do love the people. And, and we had such an amazing adventure. Um, but yeah, like going to the top is a whole other kettle of fish. And it is like, you're, you're, yeah, you're 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 juggling with life, I suppose, life itself. Well, thank God he came home in one piece, and that was that's a that's an amazing memory. And I remember you, I remember you sending videos of you with Reggie and Ruby in the kitchen, you know, waiting for updates. And, um, you know, I think that's just on a, on a dog note. Um, <laughs> they just the the stuff that they that what they give to us that we can never give back to them. It's just amazing. Yeah, they were at that time because obviously we didn't have an hour early of on and, and I was in Claire just like trying to keep everyone up to date and following the the spot tracker and following his movements up the mountain and um and I just had sleepless nights every night while he was gone. But like Reggie and Ruby took up residence in my bed and like, you know, they never did that before, but like they kept me company and kept me kept me sane. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Avi, a time where you had the last laugh. <laughs> um, it's another story about, oh my God, they're all like stories about John. <laughs> oh my God. I'm just looking back over my notes here. <laughs> the the labour ward and Everest. No, this one, uh, it, it's not about John. It's kind of um, to do with the early stages of our relationship. And I was essentially a blow in. Like I, I was from Dublin, grew up in Dublin. And, uh, and, tried to give myself ways to be in Clare so that I'd bump into him <laughs> um, but like mom and dad are, are from Clare we we obviously we like you know we would spend time down there but I was what in my early 20s I think I was probably 20. so I had no business really being in Clare but when I when I bumped into John when we first met I was at a cousin's wedding but uh, and that was the reason I was there and um and may I say that he was the one who added me on Facebook after that <laughs> But then, uh, yes, I, I found reasons to kind of make myself available in the banner. But I was essentially a blow in. And uh, when we got together and we'd been going out, I don't know, a few months at this stage. And John uh, is a hotelier and was uh, looking for ways to get, you know, people in the door, especially off season. The, the hotel was quiet. He was like, well, should we run an event? I was in Fair City at the time. Yeah, I was going to say, um, uh, less, you know, we can't forget you were peak NASA Fair City at this time. 
I was. I was. And I was filming like, you know, every week and uh, and I had great friends in Fair City and they're always so obliging when it comes to charity work. And I, I was working with a charity called The Lotus Child and they do work with children in India. And so we wanted to put on a fundraiser and uh, John said, why don't we do something at the hotel? And maybe you could ask some of the gang in Fair City and we put on a fashion show and uh, get them to model and uh, we try and get, you know, a good local crowd in and blah, blah, blah. So we had this fantastic event and it was sold out and uh you know all the locals came and supported and it was in the early days so it was kind of our first kind of uh project together john and i and uh we were on a high that that night when it was all said and done and um i remember kind of going around and and just kind of uh, meeting people at the end and thanking them for coming and i went up to one lady i didn't know her at the time she was sitting uh in one of the front row seats and uh, and I was kind of going around all buzzy, you know, and I'm oh, thanks a million for coming. And oh, it was a great night and blah, blah. And, you know, you're putting your best foot forward and all style and all glam, and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and she said, Avian, come here. And I, I said, uh, yeah, hi. Oh, you're so good to come. Did you enjoy the night? She said, I just want to say one thing to you. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah. She said, um, I've seen girls like you come and go, she said, around here. And she said, I just want to say if this lasts, I'll eat my hat. And she kind of, she meant this as in John and I and and you know all the all the uh, the excitement and um, I I did I was kind of floored to be honest and I went up to John and I said who who is that I said oh she's uh, she's a cousin of mine why and I said is she local like has she known your years yeah yeah she, she know me yeah and would she have known your ex isn't it uh, she probably, uh, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> and I never forgot it right. And I've met her since. And uh, she's very funny now. She knows that I, I never forgot it because I mentioned it, of course, like l- later on down the line, I mentioned it to maybe John's mom or his sisters or whatever. And, and maybe it, it got back to her in some shape or form. But uh, she sends us cards now, like when when we got married or when Honora arrived, Leavon arrived, she sent us a card. She said, uh, congratulations on the birth of Honora. Uh, just to let you know, I'm still eating my hat. <laughs> God, I love that she's like, okay, I see you guys. You you've made it work. <laughs> but she won't actually back down. She's, she's like, a good sport, she's a good sport about it. She is a good sport about it. And uh but it just goes to show, like, you know, you just you you just never know. Amazing. Okay, Avine, the person you always laugh with. At the moment, um, because like our lives are so insular now at the moment, aren't they? Like, and and like your whole world kind of shrinks and magnifies. And at the moment, like Honora is at that stage. She's nearly two. Uh, she's just like every day. She just cracks me up every single day. And we have a new story every day. And uh, today, like I tried to fob off a, a slightly bruised banana on her. Um it was the last one and you know when they go a bit kind of black and and I thought in my naivety that she would eat it uh, but she's so observant she's like you when you were small like she is a mini you I think and uh, she's just notices everything and when she saw this banana uh, she wasn't having any of it she said oh, banana sore I said it's not sore <laughs> it's sore she wouldn't eat it because it was sore because <laughs> it had a bruise <laughs> yeah. oh my god Oh, what a legend. So she just cracked me up but obviously there was life before kids and uh, I have a friend Charlotte Casey who like I don't see that often at all and and she's home now but she's been in the states the past while and like I'm really bad at, at keeping up with friends meeting them like texting back all the time when I should you know and I've just always been that way Charlotte's a little bit similar but she's one of those people that you just pick up where you left off every single time we instantly clicked I met her uh when I first started seeing John um she's from she's from Limerick but she was living in Ennis at the time and uh we just clicked straight away and uh we just have oh, we have the best nights out we have the best memories we just have the best crack um and yeah I really miss I miss hanging out we'll we'll get there again at the moment things are just mad but uh she's just 
yeah, she's just one of those people, just instant chemistry with and, and instant crack with. I think Electric Picnic would never have been the same without Charlotte. I remember I remember the first year I properly met her at Electric Picnic and I was on AA Roadwatch. And we'd had, yeah. we'd had a few mojitos and we were going around kind of meeting people. <laughs> and uh, Charlotte was saying, this is my friend Duran. She's head of Pothole Patrol in AA Roadwatch. <laughs> Pothole Patrol. <laughs> She, and she just, yeah. just come up with these things like she's just she doesn't know how funny she is no. she just doesn't no she's brilliant that's part of her charm um yeah okay Avian. if laughter wasn't the best medicine what would be uh for me and i i really feel it now because i really miss it and like i'm not even that far from the sea but i'm more than two kilometers from the sea so i i i miss my sea swims and that's like it's just therapy really like and uh, I loved it before I love it even more the past year because my sister-in-law June Curtin set up uh, this like swimming tribe of people the happy tribe they're called Snobby Sosta and they meet every single morning without fail uh, at nine o'clock on Spanish Point Beach and uh, they just don't give a flying fuck they throw (laughs) caution to the wind they're all shapes and sizes. Nobody cares. Nobody looks. Nobody, everyone is just living like in the moment and they leave their troubles on the shore and they scream and they dance and they laugh and they sing into the sea. And when they come out, then they have like Seaside Cayley's country music. They have a DJ on Sundays. They've had Declan Nurney come and play for them um, and they just they dance to warm up and they have, you know, a cup of tea, a slice of bread or Uh, scone and it's just like it's that sense of camaraderie it's that community spirit uh you would just feel on a high after it it sets you up for the week um like it's just amazing it's it's something so simple and I was a bit of a cynic I said to June like she started it last June and I said oh look it's great now but you know people will dwindle in August um and then it went on and on and on. And Christmas Day, they had hundreds of people. They were still having hundreds of people uh, swim in January, February. And then the rug now has been pulled out from un- under them a little bit with the with the virus. But look, they'll be back again. But it, I am really missing it because it just, it, you feel so present. You feel so alive. And uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Hopefully you can be back again soon. And me too. I kind of got into the LC swimming last summer as well, Paddy throw me into it because he's a Southsider so we just like spin out to do a pee or whatever <laughs> <laughs> there's no Declan Murray there <laughs> <laughs> maybe a bit of Dermot Kennedy or um okay Amy are you ready for your are you ready for your quick fire round oh god okay Go. okay the <laughs> actor you always laugh at the actor is Amy Schumer uh, or Melissa McCarthy in Bridesmaids. We know someone who re- reminds us of Amy. We we kind of enjoy that together, <laughs> don't we? Yeah, the biggest <laughs> revenge of ever. Um, yeah. Have you watched? Have, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more time. Have you watched Amy's Netflix special? I know you keep asking me that, and it's on my list. But <laughs> like, you'll understand, and she probably understands why people haven't watched it, uh, oh. because they probably have kids like her and uh it's just very difficult it's very difficult to get a moment but I will but Melissa McCarthy in Bridesmaids like I full-on snort every (laughs) single time she's just a tonic iconic the um comedian you always love it uh I I don't know if you could call him a comedian I suppose you could call him a comedian Steve Coogan like Alan Partridge for me is just iconic and John like I'm a massive fan John's an even bigger fan and uh we met him at the IFTAS one year and like I've never seen John like fangirl the way he did when he saw Steve Coogan he just like he got a picture with him and he was just smitten for the night then (laughs) um and finally Amy your best or worst joke I really didn't want you to ask me this question because as I said at the top of this, I prefaced this entire thing with the fact that I have the worst memory and I can't remember any jokes. But So this isn't really a joke, but um, it's something that we both got a good laugh out of recently and it was one of those images that does the rounds during this pandemic time. There's so many and there's so many videos and like such funny stuff in the WhatsApp group at the moment. But uh, the picture of Piglet, and we have lovely pictures of Piglet <laughs> around the house around the house Wombot uh, 
a few from my room. I remember the morning of my wedding and lovely messages. Yeah. Really lovely messages. Um, but there's one picture of Piglet strolling down the little lane, gazing lovingly at Pooh. And Pooh says, Piglet, would you ever fuck off? I'm trying to stop her. <laughs> oh, that was a hit in the family WhatsApp. <laughs> and it's the would you? Would you ever? Would you ever? Fuck? Would you ever fuck off? <laughs> oh, God, amazing. Mom and dad are going to hate that we cursed at the end. We fell at the last hurdle, but sure, what can you do? story of my life we learn from the best <laughs> with the with the old <laughs> cursing Claire would be Claire would be well able for I mean um, I have no idea how this is going to come together but I hope it does come together beautifully and I've loved listening to every one of your answers um, you're a great big sister all right <laughs> <laughs> trying to get emotional but don't know how to go about it <laughs> No, it was a lovely little trip down memory lane. And I'm I'm one of those people who just really enjoys your, your podcast without like thinking. I, I know people listen to the podcast and they think, uh, what would I say for that answer now? What would I say for that? I genuinely have never done that because yeah. uh, I'm, I'm just really bad at, at racking the memory. But um, this actually got me to sit down and deal with my past. Deal with <laughs> so it. Delve with it. Delve in and deal with it. <laughs> Amy and Gary, so thank, you. thank you so much for sharing the laughs of your life. Pleasure. This podcast and video is proudly brought to you by Yaple. Taste the brighter side of life.